Thank you very much for having me. It was a uh, very last minute, but uh, I made it and it's great to be here. Um, so I'm presenting a vision that is being uh, very much um, materialized uh, and be released shortly. And it's a platform for collaborative scientific discovery. So instead of, it's, it's quite a generic solution for a lot of scientific problems. Um, and it's got a lot of access along which those problems are solved. So instead of starting with a list of problems which have been listed on many occasions during this conference already, I'll start with a vision. And um, as a scientist, or as a thinker, or as a person, I want to contribute to the body of knowledge in any way I can, and anywhere I can. And by anywhere, I mean not like on a beach, but uh, rather anywhere in the body of knowledge or whatever I can see solution. That's a kind of generous approach to, uh, I think, participating in research or knowledge production. And if I see a solution, I, you know, ideally I feel generous. I want to offer it. And then people can go away and use it. And I'll be happy for that. But the current system prohibits me from doing that because uh, I'll be screwed over and uh, I will never get any benefit from it. And if I'll just be generous, I will not earn any living. So to be um, generous, I need to trust people that I work with or the people that I offer solution uh, to, and I need uh, to trust the knowledge that I build upon. So um, the knowledge, you know, the solutions that I provide, uh, they need to uh, come from uh, a solid knowledge base, uh, which is not false, otherwise the solutions will not work, and I will have wasted my time and people's time. And uh, also in this situation, I want to be earning some uh, revenue and be rewarded for my activity. But still going back to discussing the problems in science a little bit, um, I want to point out why do we have these problems? And um, what is science? I define science more than as a method rather than a subject. So if you're looking down the microscope, I don't think you're doing science necessarily. It's uh, only if you're applying the scientific method to it that you're doing science, you're validating, you're making some assumptions, you're coming up with hypotheses, and then you're testing them. And that, that is science, not a specific subject. So to scientific method is quite hard. There's a logical structure and observational structure. There's measuring to tools which uh, need to be sensitive and valid. So to maintain scientific method, we build hierarchy of people who we trust to be very logical and to know what the good measurement is. That's how it historically arisen. And they maintain this method by um, uh, controlling the people that they work with and validating them. That's what the hierarchy of scientific research that we have. But unfortunately, uh, it all evolved into gaming the system, so all these people who are high in hierarchy, they act as bottlenecks of uh, flow of knowledge. And if you're in a typical lab, there will be postdocs and PhD students, uh, and the BI will be on top, and you can only communicate your knowledge through publications, uh, which the PI will control, whether you can do it or not. Uh, and the funding, uh, is also controlled by the PIs. For example, in the UK, you cannot apply for funding if you do not have a tenure position. Uh, and then, uh, in terms of collaboration with other people, if you belong to two labs and you do, your PIs do not um, get along, you, you cannot possibly collaborate. So you can see how um, this hierarchical structure instills the bottlenecks of the knowledge flow and um, stops collaboration, which I think prevents um, faster progress. And they all do this, or people in hierarchy do it, or we all try to do is to leverage our position and reputation for our own benefit rather than for the um, advancement of knowledge and progress. And um, a lot of our production and contribution is evaluated on uh, our name, on our reputation, which is an indirect measure of uh, knowledge. So, this is the old system, or the current system, that we're talking about, which is on your right. And it's a person-centric system, and a lot have been said about standing on shoulders of giants. 
Uh, I'm not sure about that, but definitely what we're doing is we're standing on each other's shoulders. Um, and that's how the current system is structured. So we have a um, very highly structured people organization, which uh, produces a lot of output uh, that uh, via the publishing infrastructure goes out into this poorly organized body. And here I represent the um, uh, hierarchy or research establishment in the center uh, in a pyramid, and then uh, the output goes out into this cloud of papers which are very um, tenuously linked to each other. So uh, what I'm proposing is to reverse this structure and to build a knowledge centering system where the knowledge is uh, highly structured and it's at the center of this organization, and then you have the protocols uh, which are secured by the technology that we're discussing, the blockchain. So we're transferring the um, guardianship of the me scientific method from hierarchy to the protocols, and then we no longer need this hierarchy, and then people can be in this cloud instead of the knowledge. And uh, I don't know about you, but this reminds me of some sort of visualizations of entropy, and entropy is related to um, how many uh, possible combinations each uh, system can have. And in the person-centering combination uh, system, the knowledge has lots of permutations. So because it's not very highly structured, it's like a gas. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about the knowledge, and that's what we're experiencing with um, poor reproducibility and stuff. Whereas um, um, in, um, in the knowledge-centric system, the knowledge is... Uh, much more structured, so it um, um, has a lot uh, less uncertainty. But the people structure has lots of permutations, so you have lots of possibility for um, collaboration. I do not have a formal proof to this, but I'm working on it. So here it is in the system represented. Uh, you have certainties. We're um, building the system along, um, around a knowledge graph, which is tightly kind of structured system of knowledge. Um, and you have um, protocols that are shared and enforced by the network. Um, and you have a value distribution incentivization that's built around the graph. Um, and the freedoms that you get from the system is the project participation. So each person from this cloud can, uh, via different protocols, can um, make a contribution to any point in the graph. Uh, there is no reputation, so the whole system is anonymous, so it's impossible to leverage your uh, position like uh, via the name or anything like that. Um, so it provides more freedom and more opportunity for collaboration. Uh, this is the basic structure of the system, so it's a fully decentralized peer to peer network, uh, and you have machines that run what we call a peer, and you have users represented here in, uh, as hum human figures. They can either own the machine that runs a peer, or they can connect to nearby peer. Um, and uh, kind of the stack is uh, we use Hyperledger Fabric for blockchain and network. Uh, IPFS for storing um, heavy kind of data loaded files and raw data sets. Uh, then we have an API and UI that communicate to each other and to the system components to allow user interaction. So um, we, um, we try to make the system as adaptable as possible because as we can see from many presentations, uh, people have different use cases and they design different protocols. Before that was genomic protocols, so you have specific needs like um, protected data structures and um, limited access to it and different validation um, protocols that you need to apply to that data. Um, so what our system allows, which is quite uh, different from previous presentations, is uh, you have uh, custom protocol specifications. You can write your own protocol, how you validate stuff, how you analyze stuff, and so on. And you can use any arbitrary language, so you're not limited to a um, smart contracting 
of the Fabric platform or whatever you choose. And you can run the code regardless of the environmental operating system. So this is what we call modules. Modules are those bits where you kind of specify how your system, how you want to run the system. Um, and you have, as I said, you have validation, computation, analysis, and graphing functions. And any user can uh, choose to interact with the system with uh, whatever there will be like a selection of different modules uh, on the system. Um, and you can um, plug in any analysis or computational software uh, into this uh, core system um, with a blockchain so that um, any um, open software or any other software in for scientific research and computation that already exists actually can be used on the platform. You have then custom validation protocols and custom graphs. So uh, you can do graphs manually or can you can design functions that draw the graph for you, for example, phylogenetic graphs or, um, I don't know, molecule, chemical molecule relation uh, graphs. You have custom visualizations like your draft, so basically you can adapt the uh, user interface to your specific um, use case so that it's really uh, useful for you. And you can play with custom token value distribution, which we're keeping open at the moment. It wouldn't work in a big system, but because we're designing the system and we don't know what the protocols would be best suited to scientific research in an open environment, I think that's important to keep open. So to give you an example, the, when you have a contribution to submit to the network, you define, you specify what's the contents on the node are, so you have uh, data sets, some sort of claims and the logical relations between those, and you also specify the position of the node that you pro of the contribution that they're proposing in the graph. So I specify the contents and the node's connections. And uh, when it will be accepted, you, uh, you know, your authorship will be uh, permanently linked to that node. So um, you both know what you have contributed, but also more importantly, you would know uh, where your contribution lies in the context of the rest of the knowledge, and it's quite fixed. So if you think, for example, when you buy a uh, real estate property, the land registry records not only what your house is, and maybe it's like less interesting even, uh, but you know, you have a balcony and whatever, three bedrooms, but it also tells you what the address is, and it's very important just if you only specify uh, you know, the contents of the house, you would not be able to find it, and you're not really protected. So when you submit the node, it has to go for validation, and there are two types of validation, machine validation and uh, human validation. Machine validation, wherever we can use it for, um, to validate analysis or graphing functions, uh, I mean outcomes of the graphing functions. And the human validation is pretty much a peer review which we have adapted and we have a kind of game theoretical protocol for peer review where author nominates a bounty and then the peers or reviews are selected from a fraction, um, random fraction pool, so you have uh, minimized the potential for um, uh, kind of rigging the system by your friends reviewing you positively, for example. Uh, reviews have to pay stakes uh, before they're doing review, and they have a opportunity, well, the, there's probability of them losing them if they do not perform well, if they do not produce good work around time, or even, um, for example, in cases, say, for example, you have six reviews and four reviews voted yes and two voted no, uh, or valid and valid, then the minority will lose their stake and the majority will receive it. So that everyone maintains an interest in uh, actually doing work um, in this uh, validation protocol. And then afterwards, anything within the graph can be challenged, so uh, peer review can be challenged um, after this protocol and uh, all the nodes and their connections can be challenged and remodeled um, and there is a kind of curation market slash um, 
game theory protocol or behavioral economics behind it. So, uh, and that provides accountability, especially in the case of peer review, because usually what happens now is the peer review is done and that's it, you forget about it and nobody talks about it anymore. So uh, uh, lots of peer review is kind of an unfair, but there is no way to appeal about it. And once the validation has uh, come through, and if in case of acceptance, the network then reaches the consensus on the known uh, content and uh, its position on the graph and consensus on the graph itself. So everybody on the network has exactly uh, the same information about current state of knowledge. Uh, this is kind of the basic um, workflow of uh, something that would be similar to a uh, paper uh, submission thing. So uh, how the community can engage with it, with this platform. So say for example, you have historic literature, put it into the platform and then uh, a small or slightly larger community can resolve it into a more efficient graph. And then they can uh, put proposals on top of it. Uh, represented by P's here. Uh, and then uh, ideally they would go to a funding body. So it's almost like making review and uh, getting your uh, um, implications from the historical literature. And then uh, you go to a funding body and say, well, this proposal seemed good. Could you allocate potential funding to this? And the funding body can allocate uh, money, where, which in case could be tokenized or transferred in tokens. Uh, uh, they can allocate the funding, but instead of allocating to one lab, it would um, allocate it to a body of knowledge that can be produced in the future, and uh, anyone within uh, that domain can get the share of that funding. So you, you never bet only on one horse there. And then in the end, you know, after some time passes, the community, the funding is allocated, the community builds uh, uh, extension to this graph and uh, you know new data produced and new nodes produced and then some milestones or breakthroughs reached like uh, discovery of a molecule for example uh, and the funding arrives at that node at that point in the graph and it trickles down to the rest of the um, discovery chain that participated in the production of this uh, graph so in that way you no longer need to hire what are you doing um, in isolation uh, until you reach this breakthrough point, you can contribute at any point of this graph and let somebody else reach uh, the major breakthrough. Uh, but you would still be rewarded for your contribution in this chain of discovery. And uh, a slightly more, um, so that that's kind of a general uh, view of how the platform could function. Um, in the same way like we're writing research papers, but on more uh, a granular level. But uh, here's a more specific example where things are a lot more specified. So this is a, this is, um, a project that we work with, uh, with Pathogen Surveillance Network, and these graphs are a representation of Ebola outbreak, and each node represents uh, sampling at clinical centers of different uh, pathogens of Ebola virus and um, then it's um, assembled in these phylogenetic graphs uh, or you can you know specify where it is um, geographically or you can have also time series and see how the um, spread of the disease happened so uh, what i'm trying to communicate here is um, on this network with this software that can be plugged into the core you can have distributed computing so say for example, uh, somebody sequenced genome in Africa and uh, the genome sequence you put on the network, there are some machines that can come in and analyze it for a genetic variants to see um, which clones uh, are which and whereabouts they are in the geographical locations. Um, you have automatic graphing functions, so you're no longer doing it manually like in a historic literature example. Um, but the network, what network allows you to do is to reach consent, uh, consensus of methods. So say, for example, you all know that the genomic uh, sequencing data is uh, valid and it doesn't have huge differences 
that would um, allow artifacts. Uh, you have again a consensus on graph data, so everybody knows that the graph that we're working on is this one and not some other graph that you generated locally. Um, and you can use these graphs for custom value assignment to economic incentivization. So say for example, you found that the new particular infectious clone is emerging is uh, in Guinea, you can incentivize that whole part of the graph uh, or, or you can increase the incentivization and hopefully a lot more sequencing um, contributions will come from that area. So uh, we've got a functional release that's coming out in February 2019 uh, where we'll have two modules, this kind of paper module and then uh, uh, pathogen surveillance uh, module. Then we'll uh, experiment uh, with the network and see how we can play with real situation and see what the outcomes will be. And we'll invite anyone to engage with us by you can come and write your own modules or experiment within your communities in terms of research, um, both on science or on behavioral or economical models. Thank you very much. <coughs> So we are quite well on time. Maybe we can have two questions and then we have a coffee break and for half an hour. So are you, I, I can ask a question. So are you, um, w at, at which stage are you currently with the like um, implementation of this? Uh, is it? Well, we're developing it. Um, and it's the functional version will come out in February. So the stage is, I mean, we've done quite a lot of kind of backend and network establishment and communication between uh, IPFS, Fabric, and designed some ways that, uh, and tested some ways that allow, um, you know, programming language agnostic um, interaction of different components. I didn't understand where the content will come from. Are you going to start by new findings, with new findings, or? Well, you probably start with historic literature. I mean, nobody starts with new findings. Any paper is, um, has introduction. So you, you always have to put your findings into context. I mean but you can, if you want, start with new findings. Historical publications, I meant. Sorry? Uh, the access to historical publications, to publications uh, that have been published before, yeah. scientific findings. So I, I didn't get how you uh, will bring them in, in into your system. Uh, manually or by some sort of scraper, it's, I mean, say for example, you, you have something to contribute and you want to put some historic literature in it, you take five papers, you put them into the um, system, if you want, you resolve them into a more granular graph. If you don't want, you just leave them as they are. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, in your peer review um, section, you mentioned um, uh, things like author panties, and you also mentioned like um, uh, random fraction pools. Uh, I was just wondering how you're going to use that. Uh, well, when you have a submission, you kind of get the template of what you're submitting, so data sets and whatever, and then you specify how you want your peer review being done, and then you nominate a bounty, so there's a native token on the platform, so you say, I don't know, 10 tokens, which will be equally divided between peer reviewers. Um, and then to select the peer reviewers, a call goes out to a random fraction, so that you, you can never predict who is, who is actually gonna receive a call. Um, and then let's say you specify that you want know, five peer reviewers. So they come in, the first five to self-recruit uh, will be in your review pool. That's how we're doing it at the moment, but maybe there's a slightly better model of doing this, I don't know. 
So I love the idea and of organizing knowledge. It's pretty great. Um, how do how are you going to make sure? Do you have any plan for it that if people put in um, their knowledge, their pieces of knowledge, whatever it is, going to be data or publications in this sense, also historical, that they are not going to be overlapping, so that in the end we really make sure that we build up on the knowledge and not just build kind of parallel chunks that are not connected. Well, the community, so is, there's like well, what you call a curation market, mm -hmm. I, and I call uh, network cohesion protocol. Um, so the, you know, anyone, any user, or all the users are incentivized to make the graph more um, uh, coherent, so resolve uh, redundancies, or where you need maybe some nodes are too chunky, you need to uh, separate them and create two out of one, and also you know, r maintain the right number of connections and make sure that they're complete. Does that answer? Yeah. W who are going to be those curators? That sounds. Uh, anyone. The the users on our platform are anonymous, and anyone can uh, participate um, in that process. So it's not. There are no. There's no reputation. There are no experts. There are only economic incentives for right behaviors, and there are penalties for wrong behaviors on the platform. So if you choose to do something, you have a chance of earning something, but also you have a risk of losing it. So it's up to you. If you feel an expert enough, go for it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, will, does this or, or will it have an AI system associated with it? It can have, yeah. So you can have uh, actors, could be AIs. Uh, I'm not specifically building AIs here, uh, but uh, AIs can be plugged in and into here, yes. And would that be open source? Would the algorithms be open source? Well, the that? platform will be all open source. Okay. Uh, you know, the core and all the modules will be open source, and you can build your own modules, and we're building like a dummy module, which can easily be taken and uh, built up into whatever you need. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs>